An aviation legend, even in its own day, the Avro Lancaster became Britain's most celebrated bomber of World War II. Proving to be more successful than any other heavy bomber the country had yet produced, the Lancaster served as Bomber Command's primary weapon in the latter half of the war and became famous for its part in some of the most daring missions ever attempted. Today, only a few operational Lancasters remain, including the NX-611, a Lancaster B Mark VII named Just Jane, which resides at Lincolnshire's Aviation Heritage Centre in East Kirkby. Although the aircraft made its last airborne journey in 1970, Just Jane still maintains regular engine runs and taxi demonstrations that ensure her superb condition is guaranteed. Although now a rarity, the Lancaster bomber, with a plethora of remarkable stories and facts to reveal, has not been forgotten, and this programme, as a true celebration of the aircraft, will explore its tremendous impact within British bombing aviation, as well as its significant role in the Allies' path to the victory of World War II. But before we delve into this historic and fascinating story, let us first take some time to uncover the dramatic journey of this particular Lancaster, as we also take a look at the finer details and qualities of the Lancaster's exceptional design. Built by Austin Motors to Far Eastern standards towards the end of the war, the NX-611 was one of 180 Mark 7s to be produced and was to be among the Lancasters to form the backbone of Tiger Force, the military unit created in preparation for Far Eastern operations. However, following Japan's early surrender, Tiger Force was soon disbanded and NX-611 was sold to the French Naval Air Service in 1952. Having been painted midnight blue and converted to maritime reconnaissance standard, the NX-611's new role was to roam the Atlantic and Mediterranean shipping lanes. With her mid-upper turret removed, an airborne lifeboat attachment and ASV radar equipment fitted, the NX-611 gave 10 years of service in patrol and sea rescue duties. In 1962, the northeast coast of Australia. Two years after making her epic journey to the other side of the world, the French authorities wrote to the Historic Aircraft Preservation Society in England, who'd shown interest in the Lancaster and offered to donate it. An intense period of fundraising and generous donations followed allowing the NX-611 to be prepared for the 12,000-mile journey home, where restoration work would begin. In April 1972, the Mark 7 Lancaster was put up for auction after plans for an aeronautical museum in Blackpool fell through. At the time, no interest was taken in the aircraft that was now showing signs of deterioration. But just two days later, a private bidder stepped in, saving the aircraft from the scrap heap and securing its stay in Britain. Generously, the Lancaster was offered on loan to RAF Scampton, where a major restoration project commenced. Again standing proud, the aircraft became the much-admired gate guardian of Scampton. But this, as we now know, wasn't to be the end of this bomber's dramatic story, and the Lancaster's future came into question yet again when the 10-year loan period to RAF Scampton expired. This time, however, interest in the Mark 7 Lancaster was not hard to find, and after being completely dismantled and rebuilt, She's here at East Kirkby, where we can now enjoy her in full glory.
The Mark VII Lancaster was actually a development of the Mark III model that gained worldwide fame for its role in the Dambuster raids in the Ruhr Valley of Germany, for which Wing Commander Guy Gibson was awarded the Victoria Cross. The main difference between the Mark III and Mark VII models include the replacement of the Fraser Nash dorsal turret with a Martin dorsal turret in the Mark VII, which was placed further forward on the fuselage. Also in the Mark VII, the mid-upper turret would have been equipped with two 12.7mm Browning machine guns, as opposed to the 7.7mm Today, Just Jane only displays dummy guns in the turrets, but the first Lancasters would have featured two Browning machine guns in the nose and mid-upper turrets, and four in the tail. The Lancaster became very popular amongst its crews, each consisting of seven men. Invariably, the crew would have been young, and a man of 25 years was quite likely deemed the granddad of the group. The men would be of different ranks, different backgrounds and more than likely from different parts of the world, but each had their own specialised role. The pilot, regardless of rank, was in command of the aircraft and was assisted throughout the operation by the flight engineer, who would constantly monitor oil, fuel and pressure. The engineer would sit to the side of the pilot on a hinged bench that could, if necessary, fold up for the crew to pass. The engineer would also handle the throttles for landing and takeoff, and were even given some general training on how to fly the aircraft. The navigator's compartment was located behind the pilot, and would have been curtained off to prevent the navigator's working light from attracting the attention of German fighter planes. Throughout the Lancaster's entire operation, even in the middle of a bombing raid, the navigator would constantly be plotting the course of the aircraft and making the necessary adjustments. Behind the navigator's compartment was the radio operator's seat. This role also involved the administration of first aid, as well as having a working knowledge of the navigator's equipment. The bomb aimer was located in the nose turret, and if duty called, he had the provision of the machine guns for defence, although this was not always needed. Located in what were the loneliest and most vulnerable of the positions, the gunners in the mid-upper and rear turrets were, however, on constant lookout for enemy fighters. Sometimes the bombers would have to fly through a wall of enemy flak, which was designed to explode at similar heights to the aircraft, causing shards of hot metal to shoot out and rip through the thin skins of the surrounding aircraft. Not only having to contend with this, the bomber also had the gleam of the searchlights that were constantly on the hunt for the enemy. Once one was caught in the beams of light, the plane became a very inviting target for anti-aircraft fire. Although large, the Lancasters, if needed, could even tackle tough manoeuvres, with the corkscrew being one of the most impressive, and a good way to evade German fighter planes in hot pursuit.
after avoiding such enemy obstacles, and upon successfully reaching the target, the bomb aimer would release the Lancaster's bomb load, and the pilot would begin the run out. After this, the crew would make sure that the explosives have been properly unloaded by looking through the circular landing bomb windows. Conditions in the Lancaster were very noisy and cramped, and wearing a parachute was often out of the question in the more confined areas of the aircraft. Temperatures could drop to minus 40, which during the early days could only be combated through wearing multiple layers of clothes. The rear gunner could be even more severely exposed to the cold, as they would sometimes knock out a panel from the turret to increase the chance of spotting German fighters. Later in the war, the crew wore electrically heated garments. Although the men often had to keep unplugging and plugging the device as the heating would send their body temperature from one extreme to the other. Despite the uncomfortable conditions, the Lancaster was capable of withstanding quite a lot of punishment and could easily survive on three engines, manage on two, and sometimes even one engine could get the bomber crew home safely. Although this particular model wasn't needed for military service in the end, the Lancaster bomber was the name on every schoolboy's lips during the war and has maintained an iconic status ever since. At the beginning of the conflicts, however, no machine even came close to the capabilities of the Lancaster, and in truth, the RAF's Bomber Command was severely underprepared. As the first months of the war unfolded, and as the enemy encroached upon the continent, the future of Britain, and indeed that of the free world, became increasingly bleak. The world was soon amidst the most extensive war it had ever experienced would eventually cost approximately 50 million lives. By the 14th of May 1940, the Germans had pierced the Allied front into France and continued an unrelenting progression across the country towards the Channel ports. Winston Churchill was shocked at the news and plans were quickly underway for the evacuation of British and French troops from Dunkirk. By the 4th of June, the evacuation had led to some 330,000 Allied troops being rescued, marking a major historic event. Although on the whole this was a successful operation, the fact of the matter was that Hitler was becoming a more dangerous and serious threat than ever before. Britain's next major encounter with Hitler's forces came within months of Dunkirk with the launch of the Battle of Britain. Hitler knew that for a successful invasion of Britain to take place, it was firstly necessary to destroy the Royal Air Force that could otherwise cause serious damage to the German army. The Luftwaffe had been preparing for a major air battle like this for years. 
Having been dissolved after the First World War, the Air Force, on Hitler's orders, was reinstated by Hermann Göring, a flying ace of the Great War, and now a starring member of the Nazi Party. By the eve of the war, Göring, having put every effort into the training of pilots and the rebuilding of Germany's aircraft industry, had transformed the Luftwaffe into the most powerful air force in the world. At the outbreak of the Battle of Britain, not only were German air crews more experienced in combat, but their aircraft for the battle also outnumbered Britain's four to one. prospects in mind, Goering boasted of his plan to wipe the RAF from the skies within four days. The odds may have seemed stacked against the RAF, but there were a number of factors on their side, including the advantage Britain would have by being closer to their airfields. The Germans, on the other hand, would only have approximately half an hour's flying time over England before needing to return to base. The Royal Air Force also had the benefits of the effective Watson Watts radar system that had been installed along the east and south coasts of England, not to mention the Spitfire and Hawker Hurricane fighter planes. As the RAF used all possible resources available, the Luftwaffe, suffering heavy losses, eventually pulled back. The defeat of the Luftwaffe sent Goering into a political downward spiral, and Hitler, never forgiving the commander-in-chief, diverted his attention to Russia. The Germans, having fallen, began their blitzing campaign and although the invasion of Britain hadn't been successful, it was clear to Winston Churchill that more needed to be done to ensure the security of Britain's future. For this, he put all his faith into the RAF. Churchill decided that although the RAF fighter planes had been the country's salvation, the bombers alone could provide the means to victory, and with this, a supreme effort went into the development of the heavy bomber. The introduction of British four-engine bombers had already taken place, with the advent of the short Stirling and Hadley Page Halifax, but the Lancaster's admission into service in 1942 marked a new calibre of the four-engine bomber. Reliable, versatile and readily available, the Lancaster's design by Avro was a success from the beginning and required very few improvements from its Mark I configuration. The success of the Lancaster was born out of the failure of its predecessor, the Avro Manchester. Although none exist today, an image of one is easy to conjure up as they looked very similar to the Lancaster, apart from a shorter wingspan, a centerline fin and just two engines. But it was these two engines that deemed the Manchester unreliable. The Rolls-Royce Vulture power plant proved highly problematic and the failure of just one engine often led to the loss of the aircraft. All the same, Avro felt that the Manchester, with its heavy bomb load capacity and good handling, was an otherwise impressive machine. Avro's top design team, led by Roy Chadwick, made plans to replace the two unreliable engines with either Napier Sabre H-types or Bristol Centaurus radial engines, 
but these plans for the Manchester Mark II never came to fruition, as plans for the Mark III, later named the Lancaster, were soon in progress. Adopting four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, Chadwick and his team had hit the jackpot, producing their greatest bomber aircraft yet. When the Avro Lancaster was presented to the Air Ministry, its production was ordered to commence as soon as possible. Its similarity with the Avro Manchester's design was an enormous advantage, as existing components and assemblies could be utilised. The major difference was the incorporation of the extra pair of Merlin engines, for which an extra section was added beyond the original engine nacelles. The Lancaster Mark I prototype completed its maiden flight on January the 9th, 1941, with the first off the production line, making its debut flight on Halloween of the same year. Number 44 Squadron were the first to receive the new bomber, followed by Number 97 Squadron. At about the same time, the aircraft and armament experimental establishment were carrying out intensive trials at Boscombe Down. However, some early teething problems were experienced, which initially slowed the rate of deliveries to operational squadrons. One such problem was discovered during a test flight at Boscombe Down, when a Lancaster lost part of its wing. One of the aircraft that had been supplied to the squadrons also lost the tips of its wings whilst executing a tight turn. These early faults were soon resolved, after all existing Lancasters were examined and modified. During its first year in operations, production of Avro's spectacular bomber climbed at an accelerating speed, and by spring 1943, all squadrons in Group No. 5 of Bomber Command were fully equipped with the Lancaster. Other changes included an increased fuel capacity supply, and an aerodynamically shaped fairing around the edge of the dorsal turret. Whilst improving airflow, the fairing also prevented gunfire from the turret hitting the Lancaster's airframe. Protective fairing of this type was also present around the rear turret. Another modification that squadrons would often carry out themselves was the removal of the ventral turret that was seen as pointless. Throughout the Lancaster Mark I's production life, engine power also crept up, and it was soon equipped with Rolls-Royce Merlin 22 engines, and then Merlin 24s, each in turn allowing for a greater takeoff weight, which meant heavier and far deadlier bombs. The versatility of the Lancaster for the courage of bombs was a particular asset for the Dam Buster raids, for which 19 modified Lancaster Mark III's with Merlin 28 engines were used to carry the revolutionary bouncing bomb as masterminded by Barnes Wallace. The weapon, which was actually a backward spinning mine, measured 5 foot in length and over 4 foot in diameter and could be accommodated by the Lancaster with the removal of the dorsal turret and Bombay doors which also reduced the weight of the aircraft. Cleverly, the removal of the turret and bay doors enabled the Lancaster standard hydraulic system to power a hydraulic pump to spin the bouncing bomb that would reach 500 revolutions per minute before being released. No less than five companies manufactured the Mark I Avro Lancaster, including Avro itself, Vickers Armstrong, Austin, Metropolitan Vickers and Armstrong Whitworth. Inevitably, the Lancaster's successful design was reflected by the rapid rate of its production figures, 
but a concern for the strain this might put on production of the Merlin engine was also raised. In anticipation for this problem, an alternative was made to use the Bristol Hercules radio engines. This marked the advent of the Lancaster Mark II, which entered operational service with No. 61 Squadron in early 1943. As it transpired, there were enough Merlin engines to go around after all, and only 300 Lancaster Mark IIs with the Bristol Hercules radial engines were built, all produced by Armstrong Whitworth. The Mark II models, apart from the engines and a slight lengthening of the bomb bay and ventral turret, were otherwise practically identical to the Mark I in look and performance. Lancasters, fitted with engines built under licence by Packard in the USA, were designated the Mark III, and later called the Lancaster B Mark III. This was due to the introduction of new designations to the Mark numbers of RAF aircraft, so that the letter B followed the Lancaster title for some models. Manufactured by Vickers Armstrong and Austin, the Lancaster Mark III made its debut flight in August 1942, going into production within months. The Lancaster's entry into operational service in 1942 couldn't have come sooner and helped mark a true turning point for the RAF's Bomber Command that had recently welcomed Air Vice Marshal Arthur Harris as the new Commander-in-Chief. Bomber Command's offensive philosophy was also changing its focus from precision target attacks that weren't proving too effective to more general area bombing raids. Also marking this pivotal time was the arrival of American planes, and in effect, England became one enormous and unsinkable aircraft carrier, with fighter planes and bombers taking off in a constant stream. The Lancaster, along with America's Flying Fortresses and B-24 Liberator bombers, formed a great air armada that together would create a very powerful bombing force. There were, however, other tasks undertaken by the bombers. Although mine laying was one of Bomber Command's less well-known duties, it played a vitally important part during the war. One of the greatest dangers to Britain was the prospect of the Atlantic lifeline being severed, through which essential imports of troops, equipment, raw materials and food from America travelled. If the Germans could cut this lifeline off, they'd have a very good chance of defeating Britain. Therefore, mine laying was used very effectively to restrict enemy ship movement. The use of aircraft meant that the Royal Navy didn't have to expose their ships to dangerous waters, and the mines could be laid at further ranges. Bomber Command's mine laying operations were known as gardening. The Lancaster's first operational sortie was to lay mines in the Heligoland Bight area with number 44 Squadron on the 3rd of March 1942. Using heavier bombers allowed bigger mine loads to be carried over further distances and the Lancaster was capable of carrying up to six 1,500 pound mines. In further support of Royal Naval operations, a significant proportion of Bomber Command operations were dedicated to tackling German submarine bases and U-boat factories. 
A small division of Bomber Command also made up the Pathfinder Force, which was established in August 1942 as Number 8 Group. The Lancasters in the group retained the standard bomb bay that instead carried pyrotechnic bombs to use as target indicators. Over time, their navigation and bomb aiming equipment became more advanced, leading to more effective target finding and marking for the bombers of the main force. Although bombing raids could have devastating effects for all concerned, their significance in maintaining Britain's freedom was, without a doubt, crucial. The Lancaster was Bomber Command's primary weapon in the offensive against Germany's industrial and urban targets, and it was during April 1942 that the German forces would feel the first impact of the new bomber. In an extremely courageous raid by No. 44 and 97 squadrons, the target was a submarine diesel engine works in Augsburg, southern Germany. Which meant the Lancasters had to cross almost 1,000 miles of France and Germany. This sort of journey held formidable dangers at the best of times, and not only did the operation involve low-level flying, but it was also executed in broad daylight. Of the 12 Lancasters employed for the mission, only five returned, including squadron leader John Nettleton, who was awarded the Victoria Cross for his gallantry. As the hostilities drew on, bombs became bigger, and from its capability to carry a single 8,000-pound bomb, the Lancaster, with modifications made to the bomb bay doors, could even carry a single 12,000-pound deep penetration bomb known as the Tall Boy. A close inspection of the Lancaster Mark 7's undercarriage shows the intricacies of the famous bomb bay. The Lancaster became even more sophisticated in August 1943 with the introduction of the H2S navigation and bombing radar, although, unfortunately, the German's Naxos receiver could easily detect its emissions. Later, converted Mark III Lancasters with Merlin 85 and 87 engines were fitted with improved radar sets, jamming devices, and also carried window a code name for the tactic of dropping metallic strips from the aircraft to confuse German radar. One famous Bomber Command campaign, in which the Lancaster was a significant feature, was unleashed in early March 1943. Known as the Battle of the Ruhr, the objective was to target the major industrial cities in the Ruhr Valley, thus enforcing Bomber Command's principal offensive against German industrial and urban targets. The quality of the heavy bombers, namely the Avro Lancaster and Handley Page Halifax, made up the major proportion of the front line. It was within this campaign that the Dam Busters raid took place, becoming one of the most daring operations of World War II, and what was probably the Lancaster's most famous operation that even inspired the making of a movie. A specially selected unit formed from frontline crews of Bomber Command's 5 Group were employed for the task and became Number 617 Squadron. The aim was to cripple the industrial area and disrupt enemy production, although in reality this would require a total destruction of the two major dams, the Myrna and Sorpe, which was perhaps a little optimistic. 
Managing to breach the Myrna and Eder dams, the Lancaster's role on this occasion was more successful on a different level, boosting morale at home and helping Britain's relations with its two allies, the United States and Soviet Union. The propaganda element of the raids contributed to Churchill's efforts in convincing his allies to keep their focus on the European theatre, instead of, as in America's case, returning their forces to the Pacific. Just days after the dam raids, Churchill even highlighted the operation during a speech in Washington as a successful strike against the Nazis. This was exactly what the Americans wanted to hear. The repair work that was needed after the dam raids had other helpful side effects too, as 27,000 men were taken from the Atlantic wall defences to rebuild the dam walls, whilst 10,000 men were ordered to guard Germany's other vulnerable dams, as the Nazis anticipated further raids, although this never happened. From July 1943, the bombing campaign on German targets moved further north to Hamburg, with tragic consequences for its civilians. From November, Berlin was also a principal target, until in March 1944, Bomber Command switched its strategic bombing campaign from German cities and industrial areas to support the forthcoming Allied invasion of Normandy. The role of the Lancaster and other British bombers leading up to D-Day was crucial. And if the planned bombing campaign hadn't have been successful, there could have been dire consequences for the troops who landed on the Normandy beaches. To give the invading allies the best possible chance, Bomber Command had to ensure that reinforcements couldn't reach the Germans, and so Bomber Command unleashed a series of attacks on French rail networks. The bombers also targeted coastal gun positions, signal and radar jamming stations, and coastal batteries, with the Lancaster fronting a succession of these effective attacks. In the run-up to June 1944, an estimated 200,000 tonnes of bombs were dropped on Nazi-occupied France. But the bombers' role went even further than this, as they were intrinsic to the success of the top-secret deception plan that would fool the enemy into thinking a possible Ally attack would take place in the Pas de Calais. The bombers' attention to this area successfully maintained this pretense right up until the landings, which took the Germans completely off guard, drastically aiding the Allied forces' arrival on June the 6th. After the landings, the bombers' role was to assist the ground forces, with the first major raid involving the Lancaster support of Montgomery's assault on Conn. The 
Lancasters also concentrated on German transport routes and centres, and it was during these attacks, on the evening of June the 8th, that the Lancaster delivered the never-before-used 12,000-pound Tallboy bomb. The raid on a railway tunnel near Samur was arranged in haste as a German panzer unit was expected to travel through the tunnel that very night. Four Lancasters of No. 83 Squadron illuminated the target with flares, and 25 others of No. 617 Squadron released their Tallboy bombs with great accuracy. No Lancasters were lost, and the Panzer unit was blocked, causing them serious delays. A new bombing campaign then began targeting oil plants in Germany that could potentially limit the fighting capability of the Germans even further. Lancaster opened the campaign with a highly effective raid on a synthetic oil plant in the Ruhr district, halting oil production for weeks and crippling German fuel production. By the end of the summer, Bomber command was stronger than ever and Lancaster production had peaked at approximately 250 aircraft per month. Although a lot more bloodshed was yet to come, D-Day had marked the beginning of the end and victory for the Allies now looked possible. But something very sinister was still to come. The V-1 flying bomb and V-2 rocket, Hitler's revenge weapons that he boasted, would win the Nazis the war. The first of the V-1, or doodlebugs as they became known, hit London just one week after the invasion of Normandy, after which followed a continuous barrage of the lethal weapons, causing terror and devastation to thousands, which grew even worse with the launch of the V-2 rockets. Hitler's secret V-weapon project had been set up at Penemund, a remote island off the Baltic coast. But Polish intelligence had discovered what was going on, and the RAF had received an aerial photograph of the site. In August 1943, a Lancaster bombing raid by Canadian Group 6 had caused serious damage to the site in what had been a remarkable and rare precision attack on such a small area. Although the raid had severely hindered development of the V-weapons, the project had still gone ahead. Shortly after the first V-1 attack on Britain, Bomber Command initiated a campaign on flying bomb launch sites. Over 400 aircraft, with over half being Lancasters, triggered the series of raids, starting with highly successful attacks on four sites of the Par de Calais area. Bomber Command continued to utilise the capabilities of the Lancaster to the maximum, and as well as being a significant factor in major RAF campaigns, the Lancaster, proving itself as the best British bomber, also continued to execute special operations. The next major success of this type was the sinking of the great German battleship, the Tirpitz. Having survived several other attacks by the Royal Navy and RAF, the Tirpitz seemed indestructible, but the Lancaster's raid in November 1944 became the most successful precision bombing attack of the entire war. With more powerful engines, supplemented fuel supply and the removal of the mid-upper turret, the specially modified Lancasters released their Tallboy bombs with great accuracy. 
achieving two or three direct hits, the unsinkable was sunk, and as the last section of the ship's hull disappeared under the water, the sound of patriotic German singing could be heard from the men trapped inside. As well as the tall boy, the Grand Slam was also exclusive to the Lancaster Bombay. Only 33 aircraft, known as Lancaster B Mark I Specials with Merlin 24 engines, were ever converted to carry the mighty 22,000 pound bomb and were only used by one unit during World War II operations, Number 617 Squadron of Dambuster fame, which used the bomb to bring down the Bielefeld viaduct. With the ability to carry the standard high-capacity blockbuster bomb, the 12,000-pound tall boy or the Grand Slam, the Lancaster was the only World War II British bomber capable of carrying all three high-capacity bombs. The Avro Lancaster faithfully served Bomber Command, flying raids deep into the heart of Germany until the very end of the war in Europe. The last recorded bombing missions of the Lancaster took place in April 1945. A fleet of 309 Lancasters from No. 1, 5 and 8 groups attacked Hitler's mountaintop retreat at Berchtesgaden, southern Germany, causing considerable damage. On the same evening, 107 Lancasters from No. 5 Group attacked U-boat oil storage tanks in southeast Norway. The Lancaster finished World War II with humanitarian operations, including the delivery of over 6,000 tonnes of food in over 3,000 sorties. Each Lancaster bomb bay could carry five panniers of food supplies, which were then dropped over Europe to feed thousands of starving civilians. As the last days of war approached and European peace was met, the repatriation process commenced and the Lancasters embarked on Operation Exodus. Between the 4th and 28th of May, Lancaster bombers, each carrying an average of 25 men, bought an estimated 75,000 prisoners of war back to Britain from German camps. The last production Lancaster was delivered in early 1946, with the last Lancaster retiring from British service in 1954. Undoubtedly, the Lancaster played a major role in the success of Bomber Command's campaigns during the Second World War and was a vital machine in the fight to victory. It's also important to remember that without the valiant and highly skilled Lancaster crews of these fine aircraft, none of the great Lancaster missions that we've relived today would have been possible. During the course of the war, the Lancaster was operated by a total of 61 squadrons, flew approximately 156,000 sorties and dropped over 600,000 tonnes of bombs. Marks 1, 2 and 3 formed the foundation of Lancaster's use during the war, but they also inspired further developments for the production of other marks. These included the Mark IV and V, which featured improved airframes, the Mark VI with radar jamming equipment, of which four were briefly used for operations. The Mark VII, used mostly for Far Eastern operations, and finally the Mark X. This designation was assigned to 430 Lancaster B Mark III's, built by Victory Aircraft in Canada. After the surrender of Germany, attention moved from Europe to the planning of a strategic air campaign against Japan, so plans were made for Lancaster Mark I's and III's to be completed to Far Eastern standards, whilst the Mark VII was also produced for service in Japan. 
Development of the Lancaster focused on increasing the range of the aircraft by supplementing the fuel tanks and the use of in-flight refueling was considered. Eventually, Roy Chadwick and his design team produced a considerably more advanced version of the Lancaster Mark IV and V, which now featured the more powerful Rolls-Royce Merlin 85 engines and different defensive armament positions. Named the Lincoln, the new bomber entered service in September 1945. The Lancaster was an inspirational machine in other ways too, and even as it was paving the way for British heavy bombers, the design team at Avro was also planning other derivatives of the Lancaster. The first, named the York, took shape as four different prototypes, with the third undergoing refurbishment as a VIP transport plane, becoming Winston Churchill's personal transport. As from July 1948, the York Sea Mark I ferried essential fuel, food and other supplies to Berlin in support of the Allies that were helping Western Berlin in the face of a Soviet blockade. Following the end of the war, some Lancasters carried out aerial surveys, maritime reconnaissance work and air-sea rescue duties, with the Canadian Air Force continuing to use the Lancaster Mark X in a variety of these tasks right up until 1964. Today, however, despite a total production of well over 7,000 Lancasters, the Just Jane is among the few that have survived, along with just two other Lancasters that remain in airworthy condition. Today, one of these, the Minarski, resides in Ontario, Canada and was rebuilt by the Canadian Warplane Heritage. The other, the City of Lincoln, is the pride and joy of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, which also contains other iconic World War II aircraft, including five Spitfires, two Hurricanes, a Dakota and two de Havilland Chipmunks. The memorial flight can be seen at a variety of air shows during the summer months, and the aircraft can even be viewed at Coningsby RAF base in Lincolnshire. Many heroic stories have been brought back from the battlefields of World War II, including that of a Lancaster crew who, even in the middle of fierce air combat, showed acts of valour beyond comprehension. One of the most remarkable stories includes that of a flight engineer during a raid over Germany in April 1944, whereby a fire erupted near a petrol tank on the starboard wing. After gaining permission from the captain, the sergeant, equipped with parachute and fire extinguisher, climbed out of the escape hatch above the pilot's head and out onto the fuselage of the plane that was travelling at 200 miles per hour. Unfortunately, however, the parachute caught on fire, the extinguisher was blown away, and the engineer was swept through the flames. Astonishingly, even after all of this, he survived the great fall to the ground with the damaged parachute and managed to crawl to a nearby German village. After ten months in hospital, he was transferred to a prisoner of war camp with not a word to anyone of his remarkable story. After the war, the sergeant was repatriated with the other four surviving crew members who recommended him for a high decoration and he was duly awarded the Victoria Cross. 
Of the 31 Victoria Crosses granted to men of the British and Commonwealth Air Forces, 22 were awarded to men of Bomber Command. 11 of these went to Lancaster crew members, including one to a wing commander for his repeated gallantry flying the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, Handley Page Halifax, as well as the Lancaster. Today, Just Jane, in her finally restored state, makes an honourable token of remembrance to the many Lancaster crews who put their lives on the line during World War II and, indeed, to the whole of Bomber Command. Serving in the most daring and specialised missions, as well as being the most successful British bomber of its era, the Avro Lancaster will forever retain its legendary status as one of the greatest bombers in Britain's aviation history.